Today, I'm, more, I'm speaking with Dr. Matt Lauder. And uh, Dr. Lauder, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about the work you do. Sure, hi. Um, so uh, I'm a, a senior lecturer in art history and American studies at the University of Essex, just a few miles outside of London. Um, I work on the history of tattooing, is what my kind of research is about. Um, but I came to kind of work on that through kind of growing up, basically, in the tattoo, piercing, and body mod scenes. Um, as part of my kind of broader work on the history of tattooing, I've been working a lot on um, the life and times and, and, and work of Mr. Sebastian, um, Alan Oversby, kind of the first important kind of queer tattooer in Britain, um, the kind of pioneer of body piercing in this country, and one of the men caught up in the Spanish prosecution. Um, and as an offshoot of that work, um, I have begun to think with some colleagues uh, in other disciplines, particularly law and criminology, about really kind of what the what the cultural and historical contexts of Operation Spanner, R versus Brown, um, and its kind of legacies and tendrils into British cultural history and cultural life might be. So I think um, you know we, we've run some workshops. Um, I've given some public lectures. We're just beginning to, to work again on, on some more kind of sustained work um, to think about the case, not just in the context of legal scholarship, what it might mean for the law, but kind of what it means for, for history and what it means for, for, for kind of contemporary cultural life in Britain, basically. Let's take a step over to Alan Oglesby, Mr. Sebastian. You've mentioned him and that he is someone I have not explored much regarding all of this research I've been doing on Spanner and preparing for the interviews that are coming up with this. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about him. I'd like to know a little more about him. Uh, he's, a, he's an amazing character and I feel slightly saddened that I, I never got to meet him. Um, he sort of died, I guess, shortly after I became aware of him. Hmm. Um, so he was born in the 1930s um, in, in the north of England. Uh, worked very briefly in, in Guyana, in the Caribbean, and spoke of seeing farmhands uh, on the sugar plantation he was working on um, with nipple piercings. And he sort of thought, hey, that sounds good, we <laughs> could get me some of that. Um, and he asked them with, you know, over, over rum one evening to, to pierce his nipples. This must have been in the, in the 50s. Um, so he came back to Britain with, with nipple rings. Um, he, uh, he trained as an art teacher, but soon kind of found himself more drawn to London and the, and the, and the queer communities, particularly the tattooing world. So he moved down to London um, and found himself kind of this nexus of the kind of burgeoning uh, body piercing scene uh, in Britain. So he had uh, made good connections with Jim Ward and Doug Malloy at Gauntlet in San Francisco, or in the pre-Gauntlet days. Um, and really started to kind of um, uh, communicate with them and learn from them about techniques, to share ideas with them, and, and basically became the first kind of professional body piercing uh, studio, I guess we might, we might call it today, um, in the UK. So this is in the late 1970s. Um, it's really interesting, there's a great interview with him in uh, one of the PFIQs, um, where he talks about essentially wanting to kind of become better as a body piercer or, or to become a body piercer really because he'd seen piercing being undertaken at the um kind of orgies and bdsm parties and leather parties that he was at but th th these piercings were being done quite unsafely quite unsanitarily mm. quite uh, quite poorly and thought hey i want to i want to do this better basically um, and so he parlayed that um you know particular kind of niche sexual interest in body piercing into an industry um and you know essentially was by the kind of early 90s, around the same time as the Spanner, as the uh, Brown case was going through the courts, became a pretty prominent <laughs> uh, figure for the kind of fashionistas of London, right? Um, but he got caught up, so he got caught up in the Spanner prosecutions. Um, he ended up with a suspended sentence. He didn't serve any prison time. Um, but his case was an interesting and complex one for the, for the prosecution because um, basically what he was convicted of was... Um, uh, piercing his boyfriend's a dick. He did a um, Prince Albert, I think. And um, the law said, wait a minute. Uh, okay, we're gonna kind of push this line that there's no consent uh, in the law, in British law, for GBH, previous bodily harm. But we allow ear piercing. How are we gonna, how are we, so how are we gonna kind of 
nail this guy that we want to convict for piercing. And so then they kind of invent this kind of sort of strange legal logic um, about piercing um, that can't be done for sexual purposes. They sort of carve out this slightly weird bit of case oh, law. Okay. And so he's, he ends up being convicted in, a, in, a, in, a, in an unreported case, um, which means it wasn't, um, it wasn't a published case. But it, the case was later cited after the Spanner convictions happened. His case was cited in the review, the review of the um, uh, Law Commission after, in 1995 after the initial Brown uh, ruling. To go, this is a difficult problem. How are we going to convict? How are we going to kind of deal with the fact that we've said that genital piercing or sexual genital piercing is illegal, but ear piercing is not illegal? How are we going to square this? We need to think about this legally. And unfortunately, he didn't really live much longer um, uh, to kind of see the see the, the, the legal changes that happened through. Um, but I think it's kind of deeply interesting and deeply problematic and deeply kind of sad to me that he was convicted. Uh, for doing in private what he then became quite well known and quite prominent for doing in public um, and I find that one of the one of the most interesting and kind of complicated um, issues in the whole in at least my angle on this whole case that somehow um, what he was doing behind closed doors was was completely kind of you know illegal to the point of criminality but when he was doing it for paying customers it was this you know, brand new trend and this nexus that happens literally in like 92 93 94 the body piercing changes very quickly from underground queer practice to mainstream cultural practice. He's right in the middle of that. And the very fact that um, the exact practices that he'd learned to do um, during the orgies that were on the span of tapes, or probably, um, you know, became this mainstream thing. It's really funny. In that PFIQ uh, interview, it's amazing. So he says, like, he said, I, didn't, I never wanted a belly button piercing. He had a, quite, he had a big stretch belly button piercing. He said, I, I never wanted a belly button piercing, but I had to kind of pr learn how to do it because loads of guys on the scene were doing it and they were doing it badly and I wanted to learn how no. to do it better. So <clears> perhaps <throat> literally the things, that he was pro the things that he was doing on those tapes that so horrified the Met Police in 1988, um, just, like, you know, just sort of five or six years later, were being, you know, he was being interviewed by Guardian journalists. I, 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 and that moment at Britain in the end of the 80s and what happens um, and the fallout and the fact we haven't really resolved those issues is exactly what I'm interested in. Why didn't he live long enough to see this? He, so he died, he died of HIV, oh, uh, HIV okay. AIDS, yeah, unfortunately. Okay. Um, he, I can't remember how old he was when he died. Must have been, yeah, must have been in his like, early 50s when oh, he died. Okay. His, okay. Partner, his partner survives. Um, he left behind a really beautiful... Um, archive of work, of photographs, of drawings, um, and and a real a real interesting legacy in the I mean outside of the kind of spanner stuff, a real interesting legacy in the in the tattoo community in Britain actually because he was one of the first perhaps yes one of the first tattooers in this country to have an art school education because he trained mm, as a okay. he trained as an art teacher he'd been to art school um, and because he his client base was primarily at least to begin with in the 80s a gay men and um, he wasn't really a threat to other tattooists so they didn't really they weren't really sort of threatened by him he actually was getting tattooed by a lot of other tattooers himself so he made quite good connections in the scene and even though he was this sort of slight sort of anomaly culturally he was quite well tolerated and quite well liked actually by um uh by other tattooers in in the, in the country and it, in fact it's really really interesting that now some of the kind of grand figure if you will of british tattooing um speak very very fondly about having known him and having met him and having even been tattooed by him in some cases my gosh yeah okay i mean he was a beautiful guy uh, worth also checking out so he, he also had a beautiful voice right oh. he had this incredibly honeyed voice like very kind of silken and clipped and beautiful and he ended up doing a, a voiceover because he, he tattooed um genesis p orridge um, from from Throbbing Gristle. In fact, uh, Genesis is in. He's in. Sebastian's interviewed in um, Modern Primitives, uh, the Vale and Juno book that came out in 1989. Um, and Genesis Peorage and uh, Paula Peorage were interviewed in that book too. They talk about being tattooed by Mr. Sebastian. And after he tattooed them, he ended up working with Throbbing Gristle and doing voiceovers uh, with, well, with Psychic TV, one of their offshoots. And he did the voiceover for one of their tracks. It's him kind of reading this beautiful prayer about the about 
about sexuality and about um, queerness and it's um, it's a beautiful beautiful thing to listen to him talk because he had an incredible incredible voice oh okay interestingly I approached you some time ago after seeing a video you had on YouTube yeah. when I was doing some of the initial prep for these interviews. What were you doing? Uh, what, <laughs> what was this lecture? What was I doing? So um, <clears throat> that was so as I so I, I, I'm writing. So I'm writing. I have been writing for a long time. Long overdue. Um, sorry, my publishers. Um, <laughs> long overdue book on the history of tattooing, and in there there's a chapter on Mr. Sebastian, but it's largely about his tattoo work. Okay. And I, of course, I have to mention the context of R.B. Brown, but there's much more I wanted to say about that that I couldn't fit into the chapter in the book. So um, I'm really lucky at the University of Essex where I work. We have a, a center of research on human rights. Um, and when, they, when I, they said to me, you know, have you got anything in your work that touches on human rights concerns? And I said, yeah, I'd love to talk about, um, I'd love to talk about human rights in the context of, of R.B. Brown and particularly where Mr. Sebastian fits into that. Um, and at the time, um, uh, we put together a group of, of colleagues, um, a woman called Alex Dimmock, who is now at Goldsmiths, who's a criminologist, who wrote about female masochism and the law for her PhD, um, and a scholar called Dominic Johnson, who works on performance art histories. So we were going to kind of put together this project because we thought there was going to be some value in thinking about the case um, not just as a piece of legal history or a piece of legal theory, which is how it's often thought, but as a kind of really interesting cultural moment. Because we sort of realised, I think, that you know, there were these overlaps with, with, with performance art, there were these overlaps with, um, uh, with tattoo uh, and body mod history, but there were also kind of things where it kept bubbling up. And the more we looked, the more we thought, wait a minute, there's something really unresolved, right, in following the House of Lords ruling in 1997, the British government never dealt with this and the kind of rank unfairness and they just sort of left it alone. But by sort of 2010, um, it was bubbling up again. Um, it had started to be um, used as the basis, for example, of um, pornography regulations in the UK. It was mentioned by Theresa May when she was then Home Secretary in relation to um, FGM um, and cosmetic vaginoplasty. Um, and we just sort of thought that there was going to be some utility in talking about Spanner as a, as, a, as a historical moment, rather than just as a legal problem. But in the last year or so, it's become a much more urgent issue again. Um, and so we're, I'm, I'm certainly hoping to do a lot more work on it in the coming three or four years. So hopefully this culture and historical legacies of Spanner, um, particularly in Britain, although the, the tendrils are a bit wider than that, but particularly in, in a British context, is going to be the focus for the next few years. You mentioned that the case has become hot yeah. again, and why is that? What's going on? Well, um, <coughs> so there's been no real legal interest, or certainly kind of prosecutorial interest, in doing anything with that case law um, since the 90s. So there's been occasion, there was a case called R versus Wilson, um, in which um, the, the, the spanner logic, as I call it, this idea that you can't consent to, to GBH, um, that came up in a case called R versus Wilson in the early 2000s, which was to do with a, um, a, a heterosexual couple, interesting enough, right? A heterosexual couple, mm. a man who branded his wife consensually, um, it was part of a, a master-slave relationship, and the judge in that case, the, pr the police and the Crown Prosecution Services pushed that through, judging that case said we have no interest in getting involved in what happens behind closed doors with married couples, right? So in a, in a space of about 10 years, it seemed like the interest in prosecuting people for what they did behind closed doors had, had evaporated. But since, hmm. so since then, not much has happened. No one's been convicted under that um, logic for a, a very long time. But this year, in February this year, in 2019, um, a guy called Brendan McCarthy, who's a body modification practitioner from Wolverhampton, uh, was convicted and sent to jail for 40 months um, for uh, consensual body mod practices. So he got convicted of doing a tongue split, um, which is fairly conventional, I think. And then he did two harder procedures, a nipple removal and an ear removal. Um, completely consensually, no complainant, no, no victim in, in, in any kind of moral or ethical sense. But at every stage, he essentially there was a whistleblower in the case. Um, and at every stage in his prosecution, the judges went, well, 
the law says this, you know, the European Court of Human Rights are very clear, no cons that you have no uh, defence to this charge, you have to plead guilty. So he ended up pleading guilty and he's currently you know, in prison right now behind bars. Um, and then, you know, the, the spectre of the case is starting to kind of bubble under again. So it was just mentioned just this week by Harriet Harman, former Labour minister, who's working on the new domestic violence bill um, as a kind of model for the kind of um, legal thinking that they want to kind of embed in the domestic violence bill to prevent, um, again, the discussion's always about straight couples in the discourse, which is interesting yeah. and complicated, yeah. but, um, but to prevent, um, in, in her words in this article for The Independent last week, um, uh, men, men using rough sex as a defence for harming their partners. Um, and so so span, span in the span of logic is live again in a way that it hasn't been for a very, very long time. Um, and I think uh, not enough people are aware of just how pernicious and how deeply embedded, uh, both legally and culturally, the kind of thinking and the kind of legal... Uh, logic is that, that led to those prosecutions. Why has this started coming up again? I, this, this is not new information. Yeah. Why has it sort of come around in the well, circle I mean, again? That's, that's, a, that's the kind of, you know, impossible question in a way. I think, um, I think yeah, we, we're, we're, we're seeing globally a conservative turn, right? Sure. And I think this is why I think it's interesting to think about, um, think about Spanner in historical context because it arose you know, out of a particular moment in time, um, height of the AIDS crisis, in the middle of a kind of queer panic, at the middle of a satanic panic, which it was linked into. Um, it was also a, uh, also a result of um, uh, an interesting set of concerns in British cultural life around videos and video nasties about the kind of what videos can, could do to, to kids, right? And all of that kind of conservative logic, which we thought we kind of got over <laughs> in the 90s, uh, that were in the 2000s, in the early years of the millennium, are, are sort of coming back in again. You know, like conservative social forces are, are, re, are, are resurgent. Homophobia is on the rise. Cultural kind of panic, particularly about, about non-normative forms of sexuality, particularly about kind of queerness, which breaks um, some kind of normative standards, is, is increasingly kind of very, very live. Um, concerns about, you know, about um, child abuse, rightly or wrongly are very hot in the UK right now. Um, concerns about, I mean, all, basically all the things that people, that the Met Police were worried about and uh, responding to in the late 80s seem to have kind of bubbled back up again culturally. And what the kind of causal relationship is that there, I don't know. Like, what way that causal arrow runs, I'm not sure. But um, it just seems like, you know... The, the logic of Brown and the ruling in Brown was so illiberal and so shocking and so horrifying that it was unthinkable for so long. But I think that the, the attitudes are ratcheting back a little bit. And I hear this a little bit actually from my colleagues who who teach uh, about R.V. Brown and the law because um, this is really the first thing that law students in Britain learn about consent and the law. You were mentioning this, yeah. yes. It's absolutely kind of day one, we're going to talk about this. And in fact, for some people that studied law but didn't go on to be lawyers, it's the only thing they remember about their legal education because it's taught very pruriently, it's taught very kind of shockingly. Obviously, it's taught to 18 year olds, right? Like first year undergraduate students. So they, they deal with it often with a kind of mix of, I mean, in the way in which the if you read the ruling, the way in which the judges presented it was very prurient, very voyeuristic, very shocking. And talking to colleagues who've been teaching this stuff for a long time, for a long time, students were kind of horrified by the, by the ruling about how unfair it was and how, how grossly shocking it was. But I hear anecdotally, and there's more work to be done on this, but anecdotally that more and more my colleagues who teach law are finding not the majority, but some students in their classrooms going, yeah, no, I think that was the right decision, you know? So I think, I think the resurgence of cultural conservatism, um, yeah, is, is, is a big part of it, right? And, 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 and really important why we have to think about this case, and why we have to think about the context of it, because um, it felt like, for a long time, this very niche concern. And actually, it, it is much, much bigger than any, I think anyone really understands. 
How do you see this playing out as more conservatism tends to present itself? Well, that's a good question. I mean, you know, what was interesting, I, I mentioned already that in the 1995, after the initial case, the Law Commission did this review on consent in the criminal law because they sort of realised this was fucked up. <laughs> all right? They realised there was something wrong here. It felt wrong to them. Um, and they were like, we've got to look at this because clearly, because the, the Offence Against a Person Act is a Victorian law. I think it's 1865, something like that, something along, along that, that those lines. So it's a 150, 100, 150 odd year old law, right? And it clearly hasn't got space in it to think about these kind of moral conceptions of rights and consent and all that stuff. So even, even in 95, the Law Commission were like, we've got to deal with this because this is like, how do we demarcate a clear line between what we want to prosecute and what we don't want to prosecute? And essentially, they they punted on it, right? Like they they just I mean a new a new government came in in 1997, uh, and they just were like we're just gonna not gonna deal with that, and it remains it remained undealt with. But I think in a way some of that anxiety has faded away, and I, as I said, I think now there are certain forces, um, even in the kind of well-meaning left actually, and it's one of the domestic violence bill advocates um, who want well, yeah, who 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 don't share the same qualms um, that even their, 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 their antecedents in the early 90s did and they find it a kind of useful bit of because it's so ambiguous and because it's so loose um, it is a useful piece of legal um, logic to, uh, to, to base you know you can use it to frame a cr case against everything that you might find objectionable in this sphere how how can you do that well so for example so when Theresa May was Home Secretary um, she was uh, asked before a select committee on FGM, right, um, and was asked, well, do these, do these statutes apply to, to vaginoplasty, right? Um, and, you know, adult women consensually choosing to get their, um, their vaginas uh, cosmetically altered. And, um, and she said, yeah, the, the spanner logic absolutely applies to that, probably. I mean, it would take, a, it would take, a, it would take someone to, to try and prosecute it, but by the letter of law, this probably stands. And you can see that that then is a useful tool if you're a, I mean, this is again true with the, with the domestic violence case. If you're a feminist campaigner and you are against, you know, women being kind of forced culturally by patriarchy to alter their bodies, this feels like a kind of use, that the, the understanding of consent or the lack of consent that's baked into that law fits a certain kind of left liberal model of, of how consent works, weirdly. Um, and it's slightly kind of awkward to get your head around that, um, that somehow left liberals are finding this a piece of useful case law. But, like, but here, we, here we are. I mean, the same, same stream pornography, right? So um, when the, uh, the British, um, uh, like film, British Board of Film Classification were given the task of regulating um, pornography, particularly online, and what was going to be legal and not legal in the UK, they basically sort of settled on what looks like what is explicitly actually a, a piece of, sort of spanner inspired rhetoric to determine what's legal and not legal under the extreme pornography statutes so things that um, leave lasting marks and break the skin um, are abs and, and and also which um, you know which suffocate and all those kind of and all these kind of things are explicitly illegal in British pornography law so again if you're if you're if you're the kind of um, uh, feminist campaigner who finds pornography objectionable per se, that the, the, the shape of consent in that in the legal logic of Spanner, right, which is that um, there are some things which are so harmful that consent does not apply, that's very useful, right, because because um, if you think pornography is a, is a harm, many people who are you know who are pornographers or who are advocates for pornography will say that everyone involved is consenting. The, the, the shape of the argument that Spanner gives, the Brown logic gives you, which is that consent is no defence to certain kinds of harm, is very, very useful for certain kinds of ostensibly, you know, leftist campaigning or feminist campaigning. I find that really problematic, obviously, um, but it's super interesting because it, 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 it tells us a lot about cultural attitudes and the limits of consent and harm. How profoundly have you seen that change from the time of the late 80s until now? I mean, that's a good question. So I think, you know, Eve, so in the immediate aftermath of, 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 of uh, Spanner, even before the prosecution, there was a big upswell 
um, in, among certain communities in Britain, but there was, it wasn't a huge amount of support for the span of men amongst mainstream gay life in Britain. In fact, m- many, many mainstream uh, gay campaigners in Britain w- felt um, quite pr- felt that the span of men were quite problematic, right? That there was at a time of trying to campaign for gay marriage and for equality and kind of this sort of quite conservative politics of, mm. of, of, of homosexual acceptance. Yeah. Um, the, the Spanner case was just not the kind of queer that they wanted to deal with, right? So yeah. they, they literally got kind of pushed under the bus. Um, I think because of the work of P- Catnall and Spanner, because of the work of, of um, the Spanner Trust, because of the work of you know, people like um, uh, yourself, actually, you know, campaigns in the US who are supporting the case, I think for a brief moment uh, around the turn of the millennium, that, that battle was sort of won for a bit, right? That, that queerness was an acceptable and understandable part of, of, of mainstream gay life. Um, but I think as time's gone on, and you see, saw this even recently, you know, like even this year's Pride in London, big kind of um, com- campaigns, um, complaints online about like, hey, get the leather men out, and we don't want, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to see. Like, Pride isn't about sex. We don't want it's family friendly event, whatever that might mean. So, so again, I think it's this interesting kind of cultural conservative turn um, that that is is dro- you know that that is. Rep- I mean, you know. It's a cliche to say, you know, we must learn from history or it's, we're doomed to repeat it. But in some senses, I think that's what's happening. We haven't really, we never dealt with, the law never dealt with, culturally we never dealt with why the hell the span of prosecutions happened, like the, home, the institutionalised homophobia, the, um, the absolute kind of queer panic, the absolute kind of fear of the unknown, the complete kind of lunacy of the Met Police at the time. Um, we never dealt with that, and uh, culturally or kind of institutionally, and so it, so it persists. You know, interesting you bring that up because there's a um, a bit here in this in this book by Bill yeah. Thompson bringing up dealing with the cultural issues of this and yeah. and also perhaps the time in which it happened. There's a, a phrase here that says it is impossible to come to any other conclusion than that Lord Templeman found the Spanner defendants guilty either because he was completely ignorant of the nature of SM sex which would make him unfit to judge in such a case, or because he was deliberately manipulating the evidence to justify a personal preference, which would also render him unfit to judge the case. What have you to say to that? The Met Police Vice Squad, who led the prosecution under a guy called Michael Haynes, were absolutely dead set on getting these guys on something. They were like, this must be illegal. This must be, there must be some law against this, Yeah. right? They were, they were convinced, for example, as if this was in the middle of a sort of satanic panic, they were convinced that they'd found um, evidence of... They, were snuff, they thought... Michael Haynes says that he thought initially that the Spanner tapes that they seized were snuff movies. Yes. Right? He thought they were literal snuff movies. This is the kind of paranoia in the British, British police in the 80s. So, um, essentially, it was a vindictive prosecution, uh-huh. I think. I want to uh-huh. argue that. And okay. they spent a lot of... I mean, there was a a lot of energy and a lot of manpower and a lot of a lot of paperwork done on getting these guys on something right like it it, the the prosecution doesn't come from a rational place right because there's no ostensible harm and in fact the whole logic of the prosecution is that there's no harm of a particular kind I mean the the ECHR judgment in 97 broadens that a little bit but it's the, the Met Police understand there's no harm, but they, they, they hate this, they're disgusted by it, and disgust is re- as a real big part of how this is prosecuted and, lit- and, yes. and litigated. Um, and they're gonna get it on summing. And I think um, by the time, so Templeman, by the time it gets to Templeman, in a way, the, the, the train is on the rails already, right? There's no yes. way off of this yes. um, because the prosecution, the prosecution working for the working for the Met realizes that there is no explicit um, uh, defense of consent uh, in GBH or against GBH, and therefore, you know, they, they get this on rails sort of legally quite quickly. What what I think is really interesting about that, as I said, is what is the anxiety that this immediately causes, because there's no way that I can think of, that the lawyers I've spoken to about this can think of, of demarcating the things we do want to separate and the things we don't want to separate. There's no way in law 
to adequately kind of carve a neat enough, sharp enough line. So, for example, uh, in the Law Commission re uh, review, they realised that under this logic, right, if we were going to say there's no defence to GBH, then like professional sport was going to be a problem. Going to be yes. a problem. Boxing yes. was going to be a problem. Ear piercing, tattooing, um, uh, lots of the what they call. <laughs> rough force play that goes on at Britain's public schools was going to be prosecutable. So what we have to do is go, oh, we're going to fudge it because we can't explicitly say harm is illegal. We have to sort of say, well, we're going to leave it up to the, you know, up to the kind of whims of the prosecution. Um, and, and so this, this, this is why it's been, been was, was a powerful tool in the context of, uh, of the initial convictions because um, really, that they had no out because there was no there, there was no logical way in the way that the law was framed, in the way the thinking was framed, to to for, to make a case that you fall on either side of the line. Because really, that was up to the that was up to always going to be up to the judges, and and the judges basically, you know, were working in a particular kind of mindset, a particular set of well, I I, I wouldn't do that to myself, so therefore, right? But they could understand maybe why someone would get an ear piercing, or why someone would, you know, play the eaten wall game. Um, and it really, that's, that's what it came down to. It came down to kind of like, why the hell would you do this to yourself? I don't understand it. I mm. wouldn't want it to be on to me. I can't imagine why anyone wants to do this. Therefore, it should be illegal. And there's nothing, there's nothing textual about that in the in legislation. It's all in the way that the arguments framed in the in the course of the prosecutory logic. You know. Do you think if the Spanner case? It came forward today that it would be differently decided? Do you know what? So if you'd have asked me that when I gave that HRC talk, I may have even said that, the Human Rights Centre talk that I gave that you saw on YouTube, I think if, I, if you'd have asked me that then, I'd have said there's no way you know, that would be prosecuted now. Today, I think that's different. Because as I said, it's, uh, this year, it's been, it's been used in anger for the first time. And Interesting. I, I would hope... I mean, again, I think it's interesting, right? Because... Um, if you took the exact same facts of the Spanner case, so, so gay men, um, one of whom was marginally under the age of consent at the time, not by modern standards, but was at the time, one of whom, or more than one of whom, was in particular kind of positions of, of, of state sensitivity, one of the Spanner men was a nu nuclear missile engineer, um, I reckon you might find a jury in modern Britain to, to convict again. With with a, well with a straight with straight people with heterosexual um, participants maybe not I mean as I said when this came uh, when this was used in uh, ten years ago twelve years ago in Ingar versus Wilson the the judge didn't uh, convict so I don't know like I, the optimist in me would say you know maybe maybe we're better than that now <laughs> um, but the pessimist says maybe not you know this remains a huge hulking unresolved issue. Um, I mean, one of the so one of the interesting things that's happened what happened recently um, in in the Met, unrelated slightly, but there was a um, a serial killer um, who preyed on young gay men, a guy called Stephen Port, and um, he would basically find fight. This was a few years ago. He fi found guys on Grinder, brought them back to his house, um, drugged them, killed them, and then dumped them. And in fact, uh, the police never connected them, right? Even though two. <laughs> Two of the men, I mean, I shouldn't laugh, it's horrific. Two of the men were found in the same place, in the same churchyard, by the same dog walker, right? Imagine, oh like, imagine walking your dog and finding a dead body, right? Bad enough. One of those in your lifetime is bad enough. Yeah. Twice in yeah. the same place. And the police refused to connect those. And basically, that revealed, I, I want to argue at least, what revealed the kind of you know, institutionalized homophobia that was present in the 1980s is at some senses still present in the Met Police today. They they were like, well, this these are young gay men having having risky sex, um, you know. Sorry, sorry, they're dead, but we're not going to investigate it anymore. My right? gosh! And it took the families of the last victim to really kind of go, wait a minute, don't you think these cases might be connected? Um, to finally take this guy to justice. So clearly, some of those attitudes. I'm sure the Met Police is more liberal than it was in 1988, but those attitudes. To, to gay men, to queerness in general, 
to um, uh, kind of transgressive body practices more broadly absolutely persist um, in the police and in British cultural life for sure. Um, again, I mean, there was me- again there was meant to be a review again of the of the Offence Against the Person Act because at least nineteenth century law, not in the context of of Brown, but just in general, it's an old law that doesn't really cope well with the vicissitudes of, of, of modern policing and again that's just not gone anywhere because we've had Brexit and we've had you know the, the mm-hmm. parliamentary time's been busy with other things yes. so this, rem- this remains a completely live unresolved issue um, and I think probably will continue to be so I, I, so w- when, when Mac was convicted Brendan McCarthy I wrote a mitigation statement for him uh, to the court not that it did any good unfortunately but I said in there you know what sense does it make to send that guy to prison for 40 months for doing things which dozens, let's not overstate this, but dozens of people in Britain have been doing for 20 years. Mm. Why, why mm. is he the full guy? And I think the same, you know, the same applied uh, to in, in the initial um, prosecutions of Spano, right? That, like, yes. You know, they would just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, basically. Mm-hmm. They got caught in the sights of a malicious prosecution at a particular moment in time. And... Um, and you know the the manifest unfairness of it is what animates me. I think more than anything else. Earlier, you said that you're going to do further research. Is it more study on this, more um, academic pursuit, and that you used the Freedom of Information Act to access yeah. the actual tapes from this? Well, is, is that I, correct? I tried. <laughs> okay. I tried. So um, in Michael, so Michael Haynes, who was the um, head of the Met Police Vice Squad at the time and who led the Spanner prosecutions. There's a chapter in his book where he talks about uh, Operation Spanner. And he says in there that, that his officers, for some time, watched the tapes and they made a time-coded list of all the offences that they saw committed. So with that little piece of evidence, the day that the files became available under Freedom of Information Law in the UK, um, I put an official information request to the Met Police and I said, hi, I'm, I'm an academic. Uh, I'm working on this as an academic project. Uh, I would like access to all the files that you have, um, uh, particularly this particularly this itemized list, um, but any other case files that you have available uh, acquired during Operation Spanner and in the prosecutions of Arm vs. Brown um, and the uh, House of Lords appeal. And um, that was literally on the 1st of January. So the, the, the very day they became available. And some weeks later, I got a phone call from the head of the Met Police Freedom of Information Unit who rang me up and said, Dr. Lodder, uh, normally these requests are dealt with by quite low level uh, assistants in the department, but when we saw your request, it was passed straight to me. Do you know what you've asked for? And I was like, yeah, absolutely, I know what I've asked for. That's why I asked for it. Um, and the sort of, the, the, the guy sort of sucked his teeth and went, Oh, I don't know, it's <laughs> going to be tricky. Um, Why tricky? Well, you know, it's this, this stuff is still too hot to handle, right? And eventually, <laughs> the, it went through a period of, uh, you know, the deliberation and back and forward, uh, in which he revealed to me quite how extensive the files were. I mean, I, I think he, I'm right in saying that he said they seized over 200 tapes. They only prosecuted on one. Um, the actual prosecution of the, of the, the, the 15 Spanner men that went to trial in RV, RV Brown was on one tape, I think, but they they had over two hundred tapes, loads and loads of files. But they said we can't give you access to these because, amongst other reasons, health and safety, <laughs> right? So hmm. um, under UK okay. Freedom of Information Law, when you FOIA request things, it becomes um, public knowledge, and they basically thought if it was made public, it would uh, encourage people to cop- copy <laughs> copy uh, what they read or something. Uh, I mean, okay. stupid and horrific and dumb. Um, but we really got stonewalled on that. And that, but one of the reasons why I haven't pursued the, the project as much as I'd like to is because we, we couldn't get access to those files because I think they'd be a really important resource. There are potentially other ways in which um, I might, as an academic, perhaps get privileged access to that material. Um, I'd like to try that um, with a PhD student. How amenable the Met Police will be to that, I don't know. It remains to be seen. I'm going to try because I think it's important. Um, but you know we have found and I, I won't reveal on this tape we have found some other ways to get some some of the other material that, okay. that we couldn't get access to so we, we're going to be moving forward me, me and my, my new phd student there's much more work to be done 
Um, I mean, I think also the kind of work that you're doing and the, the work that other people have been doing, interviewing Roland, for example, um, in trying to kind of keep the stories of, of this alive um, is really important. And, you know, I think what you're doing is really amazing and important and going to be a really valuable resource, I think, for me as a historian and for historians in the future. I mean, what I think is interesting, maybe I can ask, maybe I can ask you a question. Maybe I, this isn't the format, but maybe, right. I, maybe I can ask you a question. What is it, so what is it now? Why is Spanner for you important now? In, in 2019 because I think you know I think people who have been involved in the scene and pe- people who have been involved with this sort of knew about it um, and you know so I've, I've been kind of thinking about this my whole adult life really but it seems that in recent years it's not just me and my academic colleagues that notice that there's something problematic about Spanner now so why why have you come to this now I, I don't look at it as problematic um, I look at it as capturing history while it still can be right. captured. Right. So many of the Spanner litigants are deceased. Yeah. Roland has been amiable yeah. to speaking with me. I am looking at it more as an opportunity to chronicle a bit of history that has been underrepresented Absolutely. and requires preservation. Yeah. So why is it? I mean, why, so why is it? Why has it been underrepresented? That's kind of what interests me. You know, it, it's been it was yeah. a, big part, a big part of my edu- education. I, I said to you earlier on when I was sort of fourteen, fifteen when this was happening, starting to get pierced, starting to be getting interested in piercing, and uh, and and so I became aware of Mr. Sebastian. And you know, I think just just before he died, I sort of became really aware of what was happening. I was seventeen when the House of Lords ruling came through. So it was really kind of foundational the way I thought about this stuff. And it's been very, very um, live in my uh, academic life since I was an undergraduate student, really, um, in how I think about the body and how I think about the law and how I think about culture. But it seems like it hasn't been this big issue of even subcultural focus until the last five years or so. I mean. I can only speculate. Yeah. I can only offer an opinion. I, I cannot offer you anything more subsu- anything more substantive than that. Yeah. I can only speculate that the nature of the case <coughs> is somewhat shocking and thus socially unacceptable. Yeah. And you have alluded and other people have alluded that a lot of gay people even find it unacceptable because it's an extreme yeah. topic. I don't see it that way. I think it's more than germane and I think yeah, it absolutely, is absolutely. it's it and looking at it in such a myopic point of view does not give justice to the fact absolutely. that this deals with human rights, basic personal rights. Absolutely. Um privacy, uh, uh, the sanctity of your home, the, the list goes on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and actually, where do you draw the line? And how do you define the minutia of abuse versus yes. sexual pleasure? And, and I think that that is, unfortunately, in a conservative society, which unfortunately is <laughs> the foundation of yeah. American society, is taboo and you're not to talk about that except if you're weird. Well, um, well what, what I think is really important, another, another reason I think this is so important to talk about is because actually I think kink communities and particularly kind of the leather community, um, both men and, and the um, le- 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 leather lesbians as well, have been at the forefront of talking about <laughs> consent and harm. Yes. Like all of the academic theory, for example, on this stuff, the best, most nuanced, most careful, most informed, most compassionate, most empathetic work and thinking has come from these communities. Yes. And, it, and so <coughs> it's ironic that the the problems that like, as I said, in, in, in the way that Spanner is being misdeployed now in Britain to deal with FGM, d- domestic violence, pornography, um, ironically, the best way to think about this stuff was the people that you convicted in the fucking first place. I find yeah. that I find that so shocking, right? Yeah. That the the people who are the most careful, and the most thoughtful, and the most systematic, and the most cautious in most not in every case, but in most cases, certainly on a community level, 
about how consent and pleasure and harm function and how they intersect in an interesting and complicated way um, are the exact communities that are still being demonized and I find yes. that I find that really it's, it's, it's completely kind of topsy turvy to me yes you know? it is I agree right like yeah. we, we can be <laughs> we convicted the wrong people um, in, in 1988 and 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 the the, the, the the space that that that, that law carves out works in entirely the opposite direction in many ways than that than its advocates want it to right um, I something this will take more thinking but something something in the last decade made more more than more than just me you and others in the US and loads of people have started thinking about Spanner again and I think that in itself is interesting the very fact that we're having this conversation now in 2019 um, is interesting in and of itself as a piece of historical thinking you know in conclusion what advice can you offer me or other researchers about Spanner that you feel would be germane well so here's so I'm as a so as a more broadly as a historian of tattooing, my success or my kind of research methodology and the reason I can do the things that I do is because I'm engaged with the communities um, directly that I'm writing about. So I don't treat anything that I'm writing about voyeuristically. I'm not coming at it kind of like oh I'm bored doing what I was doing yesterday. You're, you're weird. I'm going to write about you, which happens a lot with tattoo stuff. Happens a lot with with um, people who write about queer studies <coughs> and queer history. It's people who are bored doing their, their day jobs who mm-hmm. fancy something a bit sexier, mm-hmm. and that is not the way <laughs> not the way ethically, morally, or academically to approach anything. Um, so I think I think the I mean what's been really interesting, particularly I and mean, again not even primarily myself, but um, uh, recently the material culture research that's being done on not just on not just kind of treating the spanner and R versus Brown as this kind of abstract problem of legal consent, which is how it gets written about, but thinking about it as a material moment that affected and continues to affect real people's lives, you yes, know, yes. not least not least Roland, but um, the to think about this as, as a as a you've got to do the work, right? To go I mean it's, as I said, um, we have found I say we uh, a colleague of mine found some of the material that nobody's found since 1997, right? Um, which is going to be absolutely useful for us going forward to think about how to how to re- think about the case. But that took some work. It didn't take a huge amount of work. It just took someone to go. I'm going to go and look for it. And that kind of that kind of empathy and and materiality, I think, is really important. I mean, also what you're the kind of work that you're doing, right? Talking to people who are involved, getting that on record. Thinking about this on an empathetic human level from the inside with access and with knowledge and with pre existing kind of sensibilities to, to the topics will allow, hopefully, um, the, the work that comes out of what I'm doing and hopefully what other people are going to do as well to be more sensitive, more nuanced, more connected, more, yes. more intricate, right? Yes. Because if you, mo- most of the work, nearly uh, Bill Thompson's book accepted but most of the most of the work on spanner has been like fucking hell this is weird let's write about this for a bit yeah right yeah. um and that that is either yeah. the explicit or implicit tone of lots of the work um by legal yes scholars. so it's about getting over that and it's about treating it as a serious moment of very of a, a tragic moment of british legal and cultural history Dr. Matt Lauder, thank you very much. Thank you. I, talk to you all. I feel like I was talking, this wasn't really a fast chat. I was talking no, 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 no. This has been amazing. <laughs> Are you kidding?